Welcome to Calvary International Church of God in Christ one more time for our socially distanced worship service. Look, we've been out of church and worshiping in our homes for about the last 12 weeks, and I know you guys are tired. I know you're frustrated and you're ready to get back into fellowship with your church family, but I'm going to ask you to just hold on for a little while longer as we wait for the DOD to come out with their guidelines saying that it's safe for us to come together and worship as a community again. But while we're here, take this time to continue to worship with your family and to continue to strengthen yourself in the faith. But in the meantime, I know you haven't heard from our worship team in a while, so I'm going to step aside as our worship team leads us in a selection. back everyone I hope you enjoyed that selection from our worship team look before we go into the message for today I want you to join me in a word of prayer and as you bow your head from wherever you are whether you're in your bedroom in your living room 
on your sofa or at your kitchen table, I want you to reflect on the time that we find ourselves in today in the midst of the coronavirus and uh, while the world seems so divided. I want you to pray on that and pray that the Lord heals our lands and heals the hearts of the people. Together, our prayers are strong and together, I believe our prayers can reach the throne room of heaven. So right where you are, bow your head and let's go before God on this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you right now. We thank you because we know that you are the King of Kings and that you are the Lord of Lords. We thank you, O God, because above you there is none and there is nothing that is too impossible for you, O God. And so, God, as you look down and you see us in the situation that we're in today, where the world seems so divided, we ask, O God, that you bring unity to your people. We ask, O God, that you bring healing to the sick. And we ask, O God, that you make yourself known in the midst of all this chaos. And, O God, as we look around and we see that there are people that are united from every nation, O God, and from every tongue and and, and that are all standing for one cause, we know, O God, that even in that, there could be no one except you who is responsible. And so, God, we ask that your plan, your thoughts, your will for us becomes revealed. And we ask, O God, that you bring us out of this even better than we were when we went into it. And so, God, we trust you for what you have planned for us. And we just sit in anticipation for your glory. These things we pray in the precious and mighty name of Jesus. And we thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. I hope you felt that prayer. I hope it penetrated your heart. I hope it uh, encouraged your spirit. Look, starting last week, we went into a sermon series called Identity. And the topic last week was they labeled me a Christian. And what we found out was that as we look into the New Testament, the term Christian, the label Christian was never something that the followers of Jesus called themselves in the Bible. In fact, we only see it mentioned three times in the Bible. But those people who followed Jesus, they called themselves those who were of the way. They called themselves believers. They called themselves brethren. And the term Christian was kind of given to them as a derogatory term at the time to label them as outcasts, to label them as uh, people who went against the grain and to kind of categorize them into one segment of the population. But today, over 2000 years later, over two billion people all over the world they now wear that label, but they don't wear it as a label of dishonor. They don't wear it as a label of shame, but we wear it on our chest as a badge of honor. Something that doesn't identify us as outcasts, but it identifies us with Christ. And so today I want to go on into the second week of our sermon series. And so last week we talked about the fact that they label us a Christian. But today we're going to see a story where someone was given that Christian truth. And the person who was giving it was very convincing. But then they were met with a question. And as we read the scripture and reflect on that question. You're going to translate it. And the thought is going to be this. Me. A Christian. Me, a Christian. Meaning, are you trying to identify me with what you believe to be true? So before we go into that, I want to tell you a quick story. So there was a man. He was about to die and he was the father of a little boy. And so he goes into his jewelry box and he brings out this watch. And this watch belonged to his father. Before that, it belonged to his grandfather, and before that, it belonged to his great-grandfather. And so he takes this watch out of his jewelry box, and he gives it to his son, and he says, hey, son, this watch belonged to me, my father, his father, and his father before that. So he gives the watch to his son, and he says, I want to teach you a lesson. He says, I want you to take that watch, 
and I want you to go down to the pawn shop and see how much they will give you for that watch. So the boy takes the watch. He goes down to the pawn shop. He goes to Harry. Harry's a familiar pawn shop owner. And he shows Harry the watch and he says, Harry, how much would you give me for this watch? Harry looks at the watch. He says, man, this watch is kind of old. I'll give you 10 bucks for it. So the boy's not satisfied because obviously he sees the value in the watch. The watch has been in his family for so long. It has value to him. And ten dollars just didn't equate to that value. Harry, the pawn shop dealer, did not see the same value in that watch that the little boy saw. So he goes back home and he tells his dad, Dad, Harry said he'd only give me ten dollars for this watch. So the dad with something up his sleeve, he, he looks at his son and he says, I want you to take it to the jewelry store. See what the jewelry store will give you for this watch. So the boy takes the watch back from his father. He heads down to the jewelry store. He shows them the watch and they look at the watch and they say, well, the watch is used, but the metal is precious and it has some precious stones in it. So we'll give you a hundred bucks for it. So the boy is still not satisfied because the value that he sees in the watch is way more than the value that the jewelry store sees in the watch. So he takes the watch, he goes back to his dad. His dad, knowing the end result, sends his son now to the museum. So his son takes the watch from his dad one more time, and he goes down to the museum. And the museum owner sees this watch. And the museum owner doesn't see an old watch. He doesn't see a beat up watch. He doesn't see a watch that's just useful for his parts. But he sees something valuable. And the museum owner says, I'll give you $100,000 for that watch. That's a valuable watch. So the son goes back home and he talks to his dad and he tells his dad the news of the watch. And so I want you to listen to what the father says. The father says, I wanted to let you know that the right place values you in the right way. He says, don't find yourself in the wrong place and get angry if you're not valued. Those that know your value are those who appreciate you. Don't stay in a place where nobody sees your value. Don't stay in, your, in a place where no one sees your value. So I want you to go with me today to our scripture and I want to read you the story of a person who was wrongfully accused of something that he deemed to be valuable and when he tried to share the value of what he believed others did not see it. So go with me to the book of Acts chapter 26 and we're going to read through the end part of verse 25, and we're going to read all the way through verse 29. So Acts 26, 25 and 29. And we're going to start right here. It says, what I'm saying is true and reasonable. This is the Apostle Paul talking. He says, what I'm saying is true and reasonable. The king is familiar with these things, and I can speak freely to him. Now, I am convinced that none of this has escaped his notice because it was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Then Agrippa said to Paul, do you think in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul replied, short time or long. I pray that God not only I pray to God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am. Except for these chains. So Paul is standing before Agrippa. And he's trying to convince Agrippa of something. So let me give you the background of this scripture 
so that we can kind of tie it into the story that I told you about the boy trying to find the value of the watch and how his dad explains to him that others may not see the same value that you see. So Paul is on his way to a trial before Caesar. And on his way uh, he, to his trial, on his way to be tried, he found himself in a surprise hearing with the local king of Judea, Herod Agrippa. And it all began when Paul arrived in Jerusalem some time ago. And he was engaged in worship at the temple. You see, Paul had been given something and he considered it valuable. What he was given was his belief that had been passed down to him from Christ himself. And he took that belief, he took that thing that he thought was so valuable and he took it to the temple in order to have it appraised by the people. In other words, Paul took this belief, this thing that was so valuable to him, this salvation, this newfound uh, victory that he had gained, and he wanted to take it and share it with the people. But they didn't see the value of what Paul was bringing to the table. And they didn't see how what he was bringing to the table could benefit them. As a matter of fact, all they could see is that what Paul was bringing was a threat and was in direct contradiction to the status quo. And that should be a lesson to us right there, that not everyone is going to immediately pick up on what you're laying down. Not everyone is going to identify with the thing that you identify with. Not everyone is going to value what you value. But as long as you are secure in your identity and the value of what you believe in, then you need to continue to fight the good fight. Not everyone's going to see the value of what you are presenting because not everyone sees how they're going to benefit from them from it. But if you believe in what you believe in and if you are secure in your identity, then you ought to continue to fight the good fight. So the people, they don't see the value in the belief system that Paul is presenting to them. And as a consequence, Paul finds himself being pounced upon by an angry mob of people and then thrown in jail for what he believed to be valuable. For the thing that he now identified himself with. So Paul finds himself in a bad place. With something that he knows is valuable. And he says that if they don't see the value in it. Then perhaps I'll go to someone who will. And as he's sitting there in jail and he's awaiting his sentence and he's awaiting to be tried, he says, I'm going to appeal to Caesar. Because if they don't see the value, maybe he will. He says, I went to the pawn shop with this thing that I considered to be so valuable and the pawn shop didn't see the value in it. So now I'm going to take it to the jeweler. As Paul is awaiting his trial, he's awaiting to appeal and to bring his case to Caesar. King Herod Agrippa comes around. And this is the same Herod whose grandfather had tried to kill Jesus as a baby. This was the same Herod whose great grandfather had killed and beheaded John the Baptist. This is the same Herod whose father had caused James to become a martyr. This was that Herod Agrippa. And so from Agri Agrippa's family history, it made it unlikely that he would receive Paul with warm regards. 
But at least his background would mean that he was familiar with what Paul would be presenting him. So he may not have liked Paul, but at least he would be familiar with what Paul was bringing to the table. Unlike the pawn shop who saw it and couldn't see its value, at least the jewelry store would be a little bit more familiar and a little bit more meticulous and they would perhaps see a little bit more value. So Paul was happy that his case would be examined by someone with familiarity. But also because he thought that since Herod Agrippa was familiar, he thought that it would lead him somehow to being more receptive of his message. He thought that because Herod would be familiar with what he deemed to be the way, that perhaps Herod would be easy, easier uh, persuaded. But let me tell you something, just because someone is familiar with your story doesn't mean that they identify with you. Just because someone came from where you came from, just because they are familiar with your struggle does not mean that they, they identify with you. Just because someone knows what you're fighting for doesn't mean that they value it the same way that you value it. And so here we have Paul. He's on his way to Caesar, but he stopped to have a hearing with King Herod Agrippa. And he has hopes that because Herod is familiar with what he's about to ex explain, that Herod would have a higher chance of his heart being changed. But no, no, not everyone who is familiar with your story will value it the same way that you do. And so Paul presents his case to Agrippa. And this is where we find ourselves in today's text. Paul begins to present his case. And the first thing that Paul says to Agrippa is he says that what I'm about to present to you is both true and it's reasonable. The thing that I value most it's not only valuable because it's true, but it makes sense. And that's what I'm about to give to you today, Agrippa. I'm about to give you something that is both true and something that makes sense. I'm about to tell you about this man, Jesus, and how everything that he stood for is both true and it makes sense. Ladies and gentlemen, the first thing we need to do when we're trying to reveal our truth to people, when we're trying to make them value it the way that we see the value in it, is to both explain to them that it is true and that it makes sense. Because if it's not first true, and if it does not make sense, then what's the purpose of them trying to find value in it? So Paul sees Agrippa, and he says that I'm going to give you something that is both true and reasonable. And he says, if anyone knows it, it would most definitely be you, Agrippa. But I want you to look at Agrippa's response. Because in Acts 26, Paul lays out the format. He lays out the blueprint. He explains what he believes so eloquently. He tells him why what he considers to be so valuable is, in fact, valuable. And Agrippa looks at him with all the familiarity that he has and what Paul's saying. With all his previous knowledge. And he says to Paul. Do you think in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Do you think in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? In other words, he's looking at Paul, kind of looking down at him over his nose. And he's like, me? A Christian? You want me to identify with what you identify with? 
You want me to value what you value. You want me to believe what you believe. Me? A Christian? You see, what Paul failed to understand is that Agrippa wasn't answering him in a way that seemed as if it was the possibility of his mind being changed. Because Agrippa was familiar with what Paul was talking about didn't mean that Agrippa was going to accept the reality of what Paul was saying. Agrippa could not see himself being identified with what Paul valued most, being a follower of Christ. And as I look at that, I look at some things that we need to take away from King Agrippa. Because oftentimes we look at people and we want them to identify with what we're identifying ourselves with. We want them to believe the truth that we believe in. We want them to value what we value. And oftentimes we see people who are familiar and we take that familiarity as an opportunity. But just because they're familiar doesn't mean they're open. The Bible calls that a, a, a form of godliness. But they lack the power thereof. They lack the ability to be changed. And so in Agrippa's response, we see some things that are detrimental to being changed. Detrimental to being transformed. Detrimental to living your life and having the identity of someone who looks like Christ. So the first thing we see is that there's a danger of superficial familiarity with the truth. There's a danger with superficial familiarity with the truth. What does it mean to be superficial? So superficial simply means surface level knowledge of the truth. You see, King Agrippa was the king of Judea. In Judea, you had Jews and you had Romans. And King Agrippa, his plan was to form a unified kingdom with the Jews and the Romans. And so in order to do that, he had to be familiar with what the Jews believed in. So he had to be familiar with the law and the prophet. And when Paul saw this, he thought, hey, this is a gateway for me to insert the truth of the Christ of Christ. Into what Agrippa believed in. But Agrippa only had a surface level version of the truth. And oftentimes as we look around today at the situation that's going on in the world, there are some people that are hurting. There are some people that just want to get to a place of equality and get to a place where they're seen as equal and seen as being valuable. And they're trying to explain their their truth to people who only have a surface level, superficial knowledge of what they're dealing with. And it's very hard to break through. A familiarity that only scratches the surface. It has to be deeper than that. It has to be deeper than that. And so it's going to take conversation. It's going to take listening. It's going to take you hearing me and me hearing you and us understanding each other. But we can't presume that someone with only a superficial knowledge of the truth can clearly understand and be transformed by the truth that we're trying to give them. It doesn't happen that way. And the same thing goes for trying to spread the good news of Jesus. There are some who consider themselves to be Christians, who consider themselves to be followers of Christ. But they only consider themselves that because they have a superficial knowledge of who Jesus is. But when you begin to examine their life, 
you see that their life doesn't align with the actual truths of what Jesus presented. When you begin to scratch the surface and you get deeper into what they actually believe, you understand that they believe the superficial idea of Christ, but not the truths of what Christ would desire our lives to be like. And for that, you can kind of understand King Agrippa's response. When he says, you think in a short time you can convince me to be changed? And so I want to tell you Christians on the other end of the screen, don't be discouraged when you're trying to share your truth with someone else. Whether that truth be the truth of who you identify with as a person or whether that truth be what you identify with as a Christian. Don't be discouraged if people don't believe your truth from the get go. Sometimes it takes time. Sometimes it takes relationships. Sometimes it takes for that truth to become relevant to their lives. But don't expect that it's going to happen overnight. But. There's a danger in having only a superficial knowledge of the truth. Because some, want, some people take that superficial knowledge and they never, ever try to develop it. They stop at what they believe, what they see on the surface, and they never try to develop it. So the first lesson that we take from Herod is that he has a superficial knowledge of the Christian truth. And so he can't even see himself being changed. He definitely can't see himself being identified by that label. The second thing we see in King Agrippa is the example of a proud man. But his pride causes him to indignantly stray away from submission. Make no mistake, King Agrippa knows who he is. He knows that he sits on the throne and that Paul is down here a prisoner in, sh in, in shackles. From where he sits, he has it all together and that Christian belief that you're following, I don't need it. The Bible says that pride comes before the fall. Meaning that sometimes we think so highly of ourselves that we fail to see the need to be humble. And it's very difficult to break through to a person who cannot humble themselves. That's why it's so hard. That's why God has to take us through so much difficulties just to make us to be humble. The Bible says that if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then I would hear them and I will heal their lands. Maybe the fact that we're going through what we're going through. This plague that is destroying our country. This divisiveness that is coming between our people. Maybe it's because God's people will not humble themselves and seek his face. The Bible clearly states that pride comes before the fall and God just wants us to humble ourselves. But pride will cause us to recoil from submission because we think we have it all together. Because we think we can do it on our own. We don't need help from God. We can help ourselves. But we find so often that the more we try to help ourselves, the deeper of a hole we end up digging for ourselves. And so God is trying to tell us that if you just trust in me, if you just turn your face towards me, then I can reach down and I can pull you back up. And that's where God wants us to be. 
He doesn't want us to sit on a throne of pride, but he wants us to humble ourselves and seek him. And I heard someone once say, humility doesn't mean thinking less of yourself, but humility means thinking of yourself less. When Jesus was asked what he thought the most important commandment was, he said to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. And he said the second one is almost like that. But he said, I want you to love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, he's saying that I don't want you to think less of yourself, but I want you to think of yourself less. I want you to humble yourself and understand that the world does not revolve around you. The world does not revolve around what matters most to you. The world does not matter, does not revolve around what you value most. Who cares if they're burning down buildings? What matters is the fact that lives are being destroyed. Because others won't humble themselves enough to see the value in other people's lives. So we see a pride man, a proud man who just simply will not accept the truth. The third thing we see from King Agrippa's response is an example of what seems to be an instinctive shrinking from the personal application of the truth. So now we have King Agrippa who's being exposed to the truth of the gospel. And he's familiar with it, but he's proud. And because he's proud, he won't apply the truth to his own personal life. He won't let it penetrate him. He only equates it to that label, Christians. Over the past few weeks, I've seen so many differing views about different things that are going on in the world. I see people who said coronavirus is going on and we need to stay in the house. And then there's others who say, no, we need to go back to work. I see people who say black lives matter. And then I see people who say, no, all lives matter. I see people who say, I can't breathe. And then there's other people who say, back the blue. It's not a secret that we are not unified. But the truth of the matter is that we need to listen to what each other is saying and that we need to understand what each other is going through and we need to be able to identify one with another and to live in each other's experience so that we can be able to apply what they're going through personally. Because if you can't see yourself in that other person's uh, experience, then you're going to have a hard time empathizing with them. If you can't identify with what the other person is going through, then you're going to have a hard time seeing fault and what's wrong. And so King Agrippa's here, and he's hearing the truth that Paul is speaking, and he even is familiar with the way in which Paul is talking, and he won't let it penetrate himself. He won't let it apply to him because to him, he doesn't need it. And it's not just a refusal to allow a personal application of that truth, but it's instinctive. Sometimes we instinctively guard ourselves against what other people are saying because our truth is what's familiar to us. Our truth is what's important to us. Our truth is what matters. And so we instinctively defend our truth 
even if the other side has a view that's true also. And no doubt King Agrippa is sitting on that throne and no doubt he has everything he could possibly need. No doubt he's in a position of honor and he's a diplomat and he's able to wave a finger and have Paul executed or he can snap a finger and have Paul exonerated. But instinctively, he's defensive because Paul is trying to get him to identify with the same thing that Paul identifies with. Paul is trying to get him to see value in what he sees as valuable. Paul is trying to explain to him that he too can be a Christian. And so the fourth thing we see when we look at King Agrippa and his conversation with Paul is we see an example of a soul that is so close to the light but he ends up passing into the dark. King Agrippa is there with the truth right there in his face. And it's not a truth that is so far-fetched that he cannot understand it and that he can't adhere to it, but it's a truth that he's familiar with and he personally and willfully refuses to accept it. Ladies and gentlemen, there'll be some people who are so close to understanding where you're coming from. And they'll still willfully refuse to accept it. There'll be some people who sees the truth. They'll see it on videotape. And because of who they are, because of what they believe and because of what they deem as valuable, they'll refuse to accept it so close to the light, but they'll pass on to darkness. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you today, don't be so close to the light, the light of Jesus Christ. Don't be so familiar with it. And then allow yourself to pass into the darkness. There is a transforming work that Jesus wants to do in our lives. There is a transforming work that Jesus wants to do in our hearts. There is a plan that he has for us. And the Bible says that that plan is not to harm us, but to give us hope and to give us a future. And to cause us to prosper. So don't get so close to the light. And then allow your own ambition, your own reality, your own whatever to deceive you and cause you to pass into the darkness. There's room for you at the foot of the cross. Because it was at the cross that Jesus was crucified. It was at the cross that his hands and his feet were nailed down to the cross. It was at the cross where he was pierced in his side and it was at the cross that the blood came streaming down. And it's by that blood that came streaming down that day that we are baptized and we are saved from the penalty of our erroneous ways. So I invite you today, people, to know Christ, to not just have a superficial familiarity with him, but to know him genuinely and to apply his truths personally to your life. And let me tell you something, there's no way we can be divided if we're all united under one banner, and that banner is the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no way 
that this sickness that is plaguing our land can last if we all seek Jesus Christ. He says, by his stripes, we are healed. So I invite you into the fold to know Jesus, to know peace. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to bow your heads wherever you are. If you're in the car and you're driving, don't bow your head, don't close your eyes, but go into a moment of reflection. And let's go before God as we close out this message. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much today. I thank you, O oh God, because as we look around at the world around us, we know that it's just a result of a world that's fallen. We know that it is the result of the error of our ways. We know it's the result of a world that has turned from you. But one thing that's true, one thing that we know, one thing that we can find in your word, God, is that if we humble ourselves and pray and seek your face, O oh God, that you will heal our land. That you will no, no, not only heal our land, but you will heal our hearts. We know, O oh God, from reading the examples of all the people that have come before us, O oh God, that you have the ability to unify us and make us better and to send your spirit to teach us, guide us, and protect us. And so, God, we pray right now for your healing spirit. We pray right now, O oh God, for the spirit of unity. We pray right now, God, for the spirit of truth. And if there's anyone on the other end of this broadcast that does not know you, that has not gained an intimate relationship with you, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that in this moment they will be saved, that they'll submit their life to you and allow you to transform their hearts and minds. So Lord, we trust you and we thank you. We give all that we deem valuable over to you. And we ask you to have your way. These things we pray in the mighty, unmatched name of Jesus. And we do thank you, Lord. Amen. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed the sermon. I hope you find encouragement in it. I hope you find that it transformed your life in some way. So until next week, I want you to just continue to go before God, continue to stay in your word, continue to keep the faith no matter what it looks like around you. And watch as God begins to transform your life. See you next week, ladies and gentlemen. God bless you.